Hi, my name is Stephanie Sacaro. I'm from Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today. I'm the medical director for the PAL Clinic at Boston Children's Hospital, and I'm the director for the Dr. Harvey Levy Program for Phenylketonuria and Related Conditions. I'm going to be accompanied by Lauren Reed, who will speak after me. She is a PKU advocate, and the title of our presentation is Pegvalies, the Who's, the How's, and the Now. So I'm gonna start by speaking about what is Pegvalies. So Pegvalies is enzyme substitution therapy for PKU. And I wanted to distinguish en enzyme substitution from enzyme replacement therapy. So there are other rare conditions that have enzyme replacement therapy, which means that they're given the same enzyme that is not working appropriately in their bodies. Um, but this is actually a different enzyme from the human enzyme. It actually comes from plants, and that's why there's a picture of a plant on the side of the screen. So Pegvalease is FDA approved. It's been approved since 2018. And the trademark name is Pal and Zeke, just in case you weren't sure we were talking about the same thing. And um, it is administered by daily injection. So people inject just one time a day. And it's been approved for age 18 and up in the United States. Um, but it has been approved for ages 16 and up in Europe. So I'd like to distinguish PAL from PAH. So when I talk about PAL, I'm using the acronym for the enzyme in the enzyme substitution therapy in Pegvalease. So, um, so you can see in the second bullet point that PAL stands for phenylalanine ammonia lyase. And um, I wanted to compare that to PAH which is phenylalanine hydroxylase. That's the human enzyme that's not working well in people with PKU. So the reaction is phenylalanine being converted to tyrosine. And so that is facilitated by the PAH enzyme, but also by the BH4 cofactor. So the BH4 cofactor was actually made into a medication as well that you're probably familiar with. Um, the name of that is Saproterin, uh, or the trade name is Kuvan. And so with that medication, um, if you have some pH activity, it helps to boost the reaction to go to completion. Um, but that is uh, independent of PAL enzyme. So what is in Pegvalies? So, um, so the PAL enzyme, uh, there's many ingredients, I'm sure. I'm gonna talk about the main two of interest. And so the first is the enzyme itself. It's produced by a blue-green algae, and the reaction is shown here. So you can see that's a different reaction from the one on the page before where phenylalanine went to tyrosine and there was a block there. So in this reaction, phenylalanine is converted to something else called transcendamic acid and the molecule of ammonia comes off. And uh, these things can be readily excreted by the body and it can help for phenylalanine to get out of the body. Uh, the other important component is the pegylation. So what we're seeing here in this picture on the left is the actual protein structure for the PAL enzyme. So there's lots of different twists and folds and grooves that, um, that help it to work, uh, to do its job. Um, but the next picture you can see, it's coated by a substance. So pegylation is a coating. Uh, it stands for polyethylene glycol. That's what the PEG stands for but basically it helps to protect the PAL enzyme so it can get into the body and it can do its job. And the other thing that it helps with is because this is not a human enzyme, our body will try to fight it off with antibodies. And so the PEG helps to block the antibodies from, uh, from fighting off the PAL enzyme and helping it to be able to work. So an important point is that PAL doesn't need PAH. So um, I mentioned before that, um, that people who use Saproterin or Kuvan, that the people who respond best are the ones that have some enzyme activity to begin with. Um, but in this case, for this treatment, it doesn't matter how severe PKU is. You could have zero enzyme and it still can be effective. So if you look at the picture here, this is just sort of using an analogy like bars on a cell phone. So somebody who has a full pH enzyme activity does not have PKU, their fee would be in the typical range. It would be low. 
uh, somebody who has very low pH enzyme uh, would be somebody with PKU. And so uh, without treatment, the fee would be high. But you can have very low or even no pH activity. And as long as you have <clears throat> full PAL enzyme activity, then people can maintain a low phenylalanine level. So who is eligible for pegvalease? So it is approved for adults over the age of 18 with PKU who have a blood fee above 600 micromoles per liter, or if you use the other units, it would be 10 milligrams per deciliter with their existing management. That being said, if somebody came to our clinic and they had blood fee that was within the controlled range because they were very strict about adhering to their diet and formula, we're not going to deny them. We're still going to try to support them in getting approval uh, to be treated with pig belly so that they can then liberalize their diet. Uh, people have to be willing to self-inject daily and to send blood levels frequently and adhere to clinic policies. So this is not a simple treatment. There are many things that go into it. There are many things that it can cause uh, in terms of side effects. And so people really have to know what they're getting themselves into and be able to accept some lifestyle changes like taking pre-medications, even in addition to the injecting and carrying injectable epinephrine with them at all times throughout the entire course of treatment. There are even some clinics that make people sign a contract in order to be able to start treatment with them so that they can sign off that they're willing to do all of these things. In our experience in my clinic, we've most often been able to get this covered by insurance. So the next thing I, I want you to think of is that um, it takes time, sometimes a lot of time. And what I mean by that is that people who go into this treatment have to be prepared that it can take a really long time to achieve efficacy. It's not like some medications where you take it and then it has an immediate effect. And uh, the reason for this, again, is because this is an enzyme that is naturally found in plants and bacteria and fungi. It's not found in humans. And so humans need to acclimate or desensitize to the drug. So the first phase of treatment is desensitization. Um, so everybody's immune response will vary, but we start with a very low dose and gradually increase the dose so that someone's body will get used to the drug and eventually stop fighting off the drug with antibodies and allowing it to work. Now it can take up to a year, sometimes it could take more than a year and a higher dose for someone's body to desensitize to PAL and to allow the enzyme to work. So the next phase of treatment after desensitization finally is the therapeutic phase, but that could happen at different times in different people where they reach a point where their immune system is at bay enough that it allows the medication to work. And that's when the fee levels start to decrease. So what is it like to take pig failures? What is the day-to-day? The -day? How does it come? Uh, well, people take once a day injections and the number of injections depends on their dose because it comes in pre-dosed syringes that are already filled with a certain dose. So people take one to three injections they don't have to split them up and spread them out over the day. So it's different from something like diabetes where you might have to take an injection when you eat a meal. You don't do this right before you eat a high protein meal. This is just something that you take once a day. It stays in someone's system for, uh, for even more than a day and it accumulates over time uh, in the system. So uh, pre-filled syringes come in the mail and so people have to be willing to um, accept the packages and get them into the refrigerator and then take them out of the refrigerator uh, to defrost, not defrost, but to, um, to come to room temperature before they inject. And uh, the injection itself is a subcutaneous injection. So it's a small needle. It's not like getting a shot that goes in the muscle that's like a thicker, longer needle. Um, it's a thin little needle and you have to pinch the area that you're going to inject into like they're showing in the two pictures here because you're just trying to go under the skin into the subcutaneous fat. You're not trying to go down to the muscle. Uh, there's many places that people can inject and we definitely encourage people to rotate their injection sites so that 
one of the sites doesn't get overused because then they can develop scar tissue. So the arm is one site, the upper arm, the abdomen is a really common site, and then the thighs. And if, if you have somebody to inject for you, then the buttocks could be another area. Um, but otherwise, these are the three main places where we train people to inject. So I have a picture here of the sample dosing schedule. So all clinics are different. I'm just giving you um, an idea of, uh, well, the, um, the dosing schedule is actually what's typically recommended, but the asterisk next to the dose shows when we usually will have a visit with people so that we can observe their injections. So um, people start with a really small dose of 2.5 milligrams. They do that once a week for four weeks, then it ramps up to twice a week, and then they jump up to 10 milligrams. And so every time that people have a dose increase, we like to, um, to see them back in our clinic. And then the 10 milligrams goes up in frequency once, twice, four times a week daily. And then once somebody is able to tolerate 10 milligrams every day, then they can jump up to 20 milligrams. And 20 milligrams is really considered the lower of the typical therapeutic dose. So for some people, 20 milligrams will work. For other people, if they're not seeing the desired effect, then we go up to 40 milligrams. If we are not seeing the desired effect with 40 milligrams, we go up to 60 milligrams, which isn't even on this chart. That was more recently FDA approved. So I'm going to now tell you a little bit about my clinic. So our clinic at Boston Children's Hospital, which we named the PAL Clinic. So we established the clinic in July of 2018. Uh, we were a study site for the clinical trials that led to the development of this drug. So we actually had 20 people that were coming out of the trial that we had to transition into clinic. And then we started new people in clinic that had never been on Pegville East before. So our clinic is a specialized clinic for the administration of pigvalase enzyme therapy. So prior to the pandemic, we started with group educational sessions. So we would have several individuals with their family members all come together into a room. We'd go through a presentation with our physician and our dietitian, and then we would open it up for questions. And so that was a really effective way, I think, of people becoming familiar with the protocol and, and the treatment and some of the nuances um, of treatment with peg valease. Now we're doing that individualized just because of the situation now with the pandemic. Um, injection training from that point, we always did that individually. And, um, and par part of the treatment is also helping people to manage their side effects. So that's what I mean by adverse reaction management. So we have an on-call team uh, through our metabolism program. And so there's always somebody on call 24 seven um, who would be able to help somebody if they're having a reaction that, uh, that needs some extra attention. Um, we do give a side effects management uh, paper for the more minor side effects so people know what to do about those as well. Our clinic offers dietary support with our metabolic dietitians. Uh, we also offer psychological testing. We have a clinic psychologist for the metabolism program and those who are interested can go for testing when they're first getting started. And then again, once they've been on treatment for a while and are uh, in many cases are, are having a response. Uh, we also have research opportunities for people in our clinic program. We currently have two studies for people on peg valiase. One is a nutrition study and one is an imaging study. Uh, what I'm showing you right now is uh, a screenshot of um, a paper that my center had put out after one and a half years of, pay, of doing PAL clinic. So we wanted to share our experiences and outcomes. So I wanted to just share with you this graph that was in our paper. And so what this is showing is that in the first year and a half, we had started 26 adults with PKU on uh, peg bilease therapy. And of those 26, we had 18 people that we classified as responders. Uh, when I say responder, um, our clinic decided to classify someone as a responder if the fee uh, went lower than 360 micromoles per liter and the, um, and the phenylalanine level was less than half of what it was when it started. So if we're looking at the people that we consider to be good responders, uh, we can 
follow the bottom curve and that is an average of our people we consider responders. And so for that group, the overall decrease in phenylalanine was 68% plus or minus 24%. Um, and then for people who didn't meet that criteria as a responder, even for the people that we called non-responders, even that group went down on average 24% in their fee levels. And since this paper was published, a lot of them have finished uh, with their phenylalanine decline, uh, getting into the normal range and then uh, being on uh, an unrestricted diet. So this is a sample of an individual's chart. Since the last one was an average, this is an individual's chart um, watching their decline in fee on pig bellies. So you can see this person started with a fee level around 20 milligrams per deciliter, which is, um, it was slightly under 1200 micromoles per liter. And um, by 11 weeks, it looks like they started to have a decline in their fee level. And by 16 weeks, it had dropped to zero. So what I'm showing here with this uh, dark arrow is that this is where we added in protein. Um, once the fee level dropped low, we add back in protein. And when we add in protein in the diet, we can also take away protein from the formula. So we will typically add in 10 to 20 grams of protein uh, at a time when somebody's fee level falls. And so at this point, they added protein fee level was still zero, they added more protein, fee level bumped up a little bit. After some time, it dropped down to zero again. Uh, at that point, we would add more protein. And then at some point, shortly after that, the person is probably getting um, as much protein as they would like to take. Uh, we aim for people to be on an unrestricted diet. So we would at least like them to be taking the recommended daily allowance of protein um, but some people are taking twice that much. We have a couple individuals in our clinic that take around 200 grams of protein a day from food, no formula by their choice. So uh, next I'm going to give you our overall outcomes and this has been updated since that publication that I showed you. So we have treated 57 total patients and we have 45 active patients. So just to let you know what happened to those other patients, um, we had 20 people who were in the clinical trial and four of them had transferred out of, the, out of our center just to go back to their local center. So they didn't have to travel so far. And then of the 37 people who were previously new to the drug, um, we had eight of them that discontinued treatment. So let's just go over the reasons for discontinuation. So there were various reasons. Um, four of them were because of adverse events or because of side effects, um, one of which was anaphylaxis. One was related to anxiety. There were two who had inconsistent response, meaning that the fee went low but then didn't stay low and uh, became fatigued with injecting themselves. And then we had one person who left in order to enter a clinical trial um, for which uh, he couldn't actually be on another medication. And uh, so just breaking down these numbers a little bit more, we have 40 out of 45 of the active patients that are showing a response to treatment, most of them being on a regular diet. And um, of these 45 active patients, 42 of them have been on treatment for greater than one year. All right, and next moving on to our side effects data. So um, this slide shows the side effects. This was from our paper with the first year and a half. And um, you can see what some of the most common side effects were that people experienced. And um, they're color coded. And also you can see here that they are by week. So this shows you weeks two to five. This shows week six to nine. So those are three week intervals. This, these peaks are a little higher, but this actually is showing nine weeks instead of three weeks. So really over time, the amount of side effects are just going down. And these are not side effects they're having throughout that whole period. This means they had that at least once during that period. And so the most common side effect is the one that's seen in the blue, the medium blue color, and that's an injection site reaction. So that could include redness at the site, swelling of the site, um, a feeling of hardness, itchiness, 
um, right where the needle goes into the skin. And so that was seen in about 88% of people. And then joint pain is one of the significant side effects that we have to contend with. And that was seen in 69% of our patients. We saw rash in a similar number of people at some point. We had 46 people who reported fatigue, 35% um, had reported headaches and 27% uh, GI symptoms. Fever and chills. Um, this was something that we almost exclusively saw right, right around one to two weeks after the first injection. And so that has to do with desensitization and the antibody response. Um, hair loss is a side effect that has been seen in our patient population, but we don't actually think that's caused directly by the enzyme therapy. It seems to more be correlated with people that have a rapid drop in their phenylalanine um, or you know, with or without having sustained low phenylalanine levels. So uh, we really want frequent monitoring so that if somebody does have a drop in their phenylalanine, we can catch it early. Um, because having this, uh, this rapid drop can cause a shock to the hair follicles. And so it can sort of reset the hair follicles. It causes a period of hair loss, and then the hair will grow back after that and be fine from there in our experience with, with most people. And uh, some people have had some lymph node swelling. So uh, lymph nodes feel like little bumps under the skin in certain areas of drainage of lymphatic fluid. So um, that is directly related to the lymph nodes just reacting to the injections, but that has been benign and, um, and dizziness has been reported. So uh, when people do have significant side effects like joint pain, um, we have prescribed steroid, short courses of steroid in a number of people. So in 42%, of our patients from this first group, we had prescribed steroids to help them get through the side effects and continue on in treatment. Uh, so the next point I wanna make is that dosing is individualized to each person. So it doesn't really look like we have a whole lot of options uh, when you see that it only comes in 2.5 milligrams, 10 milligram and 20 milligram strength. These are pre-filled syringes that they come in. So it's not something that people can draw up their own individualized dose themselves. They're pre-filled. And uh, once, once somebody pushes on the plunger, uh, then the needle automatically retracts. So that part is actually really nice with having pre-filled syringes. Uh, but what we've learned is that the drug doesn't necessarily need to be administered every day in everyone. Uh, because it does uh, build up in the system, we actually realize that we can look at someone's weekly dose and not not that they necessarily have to take the identical daily dose as their ultimate dose. So, um, so we have some people that have been alternating 2.5 and 5 milligrams, so much lower than we think that someone would need to maintain control. Um, I have a patient who gets only 10 milligrams twice a week, and that's enough to keep the fee levels in a great range and uh, be on an unrestricted diet. Um, but we have some people who have to take 60 milligrams, so they have to do three injections of the 20 every day. So, um, so this is different in everybody, um, but what we found actually, which is interesting, is if I compare our study patients to the people who started drug more recently after the study ended through clinic, then I find that the dose that people, um, the, the people um, were taking that, um, that came out of the study is actually a lot lower than people who are non-study patients. So, uh, so the average dose for our study patients, uh, last time I calculated was 17 milligrams a day. And for the non-study patients, the average dose was 32.5 milligrams per day. So over time, the longer people are on the drug, in my clinic's experience, the less that they actually need. Um, another thing that we're trying to do with some people just to uh, make the experience more pleasant is that if we're able to do a dosing reduction just so that it's fewer injections a week, we're trying to do that. So for example, if somebody is taking a dose of 70 milligrams per week, if they're on a dose of 10 milligrams every day, that's pretty close to what a dose would be for a week by just taking three of the 20 milligrams, which would be 60 milligrams a week. So if we can do that and reduce the number of times somebody has to inject, 
if somebody is interested in doing that, then we'll try to do that. Though there are people that prefer the consistency. So again, it's really individualized. So in summary, Pegvalis has helped many people with PKU to maintain low blood fee while eating a regular diet and has allowed people to go off of their formula at the same time. Um, it does cause an immune response with side effects and the side effects are more prevalent early in treatment. But there is an ongoing risk for anaphylaxis. So people who are on treatment throughout the course are to keep with them their injectable epinephrine just in case uh, they do have a reaction at some point. Um, and then the degree of response and the amount of time it takes to attain a response varies. But in my clinic's experience with enough time, if the people can get through the side effects, then most people do have substantial fee reduction into the normal range. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Again, it was a pleasure to be here today and I look forward to the question and answer session. And now we're going to hear from Lauren Reed about her personal experience with Peg Valiase. Thank you, Dr. Sagaro. Hi everyone, my name is Lauren Reed, and I thought I would just start off by giving a little information about myself. Fun fact about me, I absolutely love the Backstreet Boys, I listen to them every day. I was fortunate enough to be able to see them in Las Vegas when they had their residency there. I was a cheerleader in college at Northern State University, and I compete in pageants with PKU Awareness as my community service platform. I'm currently the United States of America's Mrs. Cowlitz County 2021. I will be competing for Mrs. Washington in August. I was born in Denver, Colorado, lived there until I was 10. And then my mom and I moved um, to Vancouver, Washington, and we lived there until I graduated high school. That's when we moved to Aberdeen, South Dakota, where I was able to go to Northern State, like my mom did, and like I said, be a cheerleader for football and basketball. I was also really involved in other aspects of campus life. I was business club vice president and president, and I had the opportunity to present two uh, business economic papers that I co-authored with a professor at an international business conference, and those two papers were later published. I graduated in 2015 with a Bachelor of Arts in International Business and a Bachelor of Science in Economics. My husband and I now live in Kalama, Washington, where I work as a government planning assistant for a long-range planning agency. We do everything from transportation plans with Department of Transportation, to downtown revitalization, entrepreneurship development, basically anything that the community needs us to do. I am also a proud member of the General Federation of Women's Clubs Kalama chapter called AMALAC, which fun fact is Kalama spelled backwards. And I started taking Peg Valiers in January of 2019. I was diagnosed with PKU at nine days old. I was fortunate enough to have a mom who was really, really involved with my clinic and was very, very diligent about my diet. She would work with my school lunch program to make sure that I was eating as normal as possible at school so I didn't feel left out or too different. And she also worked with the nurse to make sure I could drink my formula at school. Even though she was really, really diligent about my diet, and teaching me how to manage my own PKU from a really young age, my levels were consistently high. They usually ran around the nine-ish milligrams per deciliter range, which was, you know, higher than the clinic would like. And they actually hospitalized me twice when I lived in Denver to try to get my levels down. And both times they stayed the same. My extended family has always been really curious about my PKU. They want to learn more. They want to make sure that I'm involved at family functions that involve food, which is all of them. So they always ask, hey, Lauren, what can we bring? Do you want to bring something that's kind of like this, since this is what we're having? And that's always been really, really nice. 
the hardest part of growing up with PKU, I think, was when I went to college in South Dakota. I had really limited access to medical food, and at one point I actually had to ration my formula. So I never went off diet completely, but I definitely stretched the boundaries a little bit because I had to eat, I had to function. And that's when I really started to experience those typical symptoms of high fee, the lack of focus, just not being able to, to do a whole lot, feeling like I had a really bad brain fog going on. It was also when I started failing exams. I didn't even know if I was gonna be able to finish college. <clears throat> I would take an exam in class and completely fail it, just like not even close to passing at all. And my professors were really baffled by this because I would go to class, I'd participate, my homework was always correct, but when it came time to take a test, I would fail. So my management information systems professor decided to do a little experiment and have me come into class after after hours during his office hours time and take an exam over the same material on a paper test instead of on the computer and gave me as much time as I needed. I could talk out my answers, whatever I needed to do, and I passed. So from that point on, I started taking my exams in the disabilities office. So I would go in there, they would have my exams already there, sit in a nice little quiet room, I could have my classical music playing if I wanted to, I could talk out my answers, whatever I needed to do to get that exam done and pass it. And so that, that's how I finished college and it was a real struggle for me. I, I'd never had to deal with high fee levels like that before. So it was really scary and I didn't really know, know what to do. I first heard about the injections when they were starting clinical trials. Unfortunately, I was unable to participate in the trials. So I very impatiently waited for them to be approved. When my husband and I moved back here to Washington, we started discussing it and thought it would be a good course of action for, for me to do. So we talked about it with my clinic at my next appointment. My doctor educated me very, very thoroughly about how the injections work with my body to lower my fee levels. And he knows I'm a really, really visual learner. So he drew lots of diagrams, brought my husband into the conversation so he could understand it just as well as I did. And before starting the injections, my levels were at 24 milligrams per deciliter which is insane. And I don't even know how I was functioning. <clears throat> so we set everything up that I was gonna do my first injection at clinic and the day arrived. We get ready, we're going, we're driving down there. And I was really, really, really nervous. So I dressed up to make sure that I had a little bit of confidence, you know, cause I was like the closest, I was really scared, but I was doing it anyway. And I had all of these what ifs going through my head. What if I do it wrong? What if it hurts? What if it doesn't work? What if I have a reaction I can't use it? So I was going through all of these what if scenarios in my head. And then I get there, we go into a bigger exam room than normal. My husband was there, my dietitian was there, the doctor was there, my pharmaceutical rep was there. I feel like everybody and their dog was in this room watching me do this injection, which in itself is a little nerve wracking. But I did my injection, went to sit there for an hour to make sure I didn't have a reaction. And I had gotten myself so worried for nothing. It didn't hurt. I didn't mess it up. And I didn't have a reaction. And I sat there and I was like, hey, I can do this. It's going to be fine. Great. We're just going to cruise. We're going to be fine. And my doctors let me know that they had to build up my tolerance to the injection. So they gave me a little schedule. And I started at two and a half milligrams once a week and then gradually increase my dosage. <clears throat> Before starting the injections, I was doing 60 milligrams of protein from formula and 10 milligrams from food or 10 grams from food per day, which was hard because after not having formula, for a long time and then moving here and going to that's my main source of protein was really hard to try to get back into the swing of that and 
since I really got back on the low pro diet before starting the injections and while I was starting them, I've decided to stay plant-based, um, so vegetarian pretty much, which has presented its own set of challenges. So I've been working really, really close with my clinic and my dietitian to make sure I have a really healthy, balanced nutrition plan. So I'm getting in all of my protein, my carbs, my fats, so my macronutrients, making sure I'm getting all of my micronutrients, but also making sure I'm getting enough protein now that I'm just eating food. And that's been the hardest part is relearning how to eat, getting over that mental hurdle of you're eating these foods you've been taught your entire life that you can't eat. So that's been a struggle for me. I've been really fortunate to not experience any side effects other than a little bit of injection site reactions, a little bit of redness and itching, nothing, nothing major, a little bit of joint pain in the beginning when my body was getting used to it. But my clinic did prescribe me pre-meds, so I take those to help reduce the risk of getting side effects. This is probably my favorite, my favorite picture comparison. And it was when, you know, before I started the injections to after I reached efficacy in October of 2019. So I, I reached efficacy pretty quickly. My levels started dropping really, really slowly at first. And then they got down to 12 milligrams per deciliter. And I was really, really excited. It hadn't been that low in a really long time. And then they jumped back up to my baseline and I got really discouraged. I was like, man, this isn't working. I'm not gonna be able to do this. And I'm gonna have to go back, go back to my my other treatment, which wasn't working as well. <laughs> my clinic reassured me that your body's just adjusting. Keep doing what you're doing, keep sticking to your schedule that we gave you, keep turning in your fee levels, don't change your diet, just keep doing what you're doing and it will be fine. And it was. So after reaching efficacy, I noticed that my hair got darker, my eyebrows got darker, my eyes got more vibrant, they're more blue now than they were, then they used to be really gray. I'm able to get a tan now, which is really exciting. And this is gonna sound weird, but the undertone of my skin has changed. So I had to relearn how to do my makeup too. And guys might not think that's a big deal, but for a girl who's been doing her makeup the same way since she was like 15, it's it's a big deal. So I had a lot of different changes going on. I feel like a new person. I remember when I reached efficacy and my levels got within treatment range for the first time in a really long time, I told my clinic that I felt like a Borg from Star Trek because I was super efficient. I was just on top of everything. I was accomplishing everything. And I didn't realize how bad I was feeling until I didn't feel that way anymore. I currently take 40 milligrams of pig valleys, so two syringes every day, and I eat 75 grams of protein, and I don't take any formula. And that's my story about starting pig valleys. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, we are uh, back for a question and answer session. Um, I really enjoyed hearing your story, Lauren. Um, fascinating in, in so many ways. Uh, when I go to the research conferences and uh, they they show the, the mice that have PKU or not, you know, you can tell if they're treated because of the because of their color and your your coloring that was um, really interesting. I definitely have seen that as well, that um, that people's coloration can change once their uh, tyrosine is adequate. So, um, all right, so let's uh, take a look at some of the questions. Okay, so I think that I have questions in the chat and in the Q&A, uh, but I'll start with uh, the Q&A questions. So uh, the question is um, for the people that have to take a higher milligram dosage, are they more likely to get reactions or side effects? So in my experience, um, it takes a long time 
to get up to the point where we go up to a higher dose for some people. Um, people stay on 20 milligrams for six months before they go up to 40 or 60. And by then the side effects are usually gone or mostly gone um, because the side effects predominantly happen early on. So I'm not really seeing more side effects with the people on higher doses because they've had a lot more time to acclimate to the drug altogether. And early on, we go, we take big jumps. So we go from 2.5 milligrams to 10 milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams. Um, and then once we go up higher in the doses, you're going 20 to 40, and then you're going 40 to 60. So, um, so yes, you are doubling the dose uh, for that first increment, and then it's not doubling to make that second leap. Anything you wanted to contribute, Lauren? Oh, okay. So let's see um, in the chat. Let's go up to the top. All right, so is there a chance that the age in the US could be dropped as well? Um, I think that's a chance. Um, I'm independent of the drug company, so I don't really know what their plans are, but um, it, it is kind of clinic dependent. And I know that there are other clinics, um, mine included, that, that do treat some people off label that are younger than 18, if they think that, uh, that they can handle it and, and deal with the side effects. Um, the next question, could this be administered orally potentially? That I don't know. I think that um, that would obviously be really desirable um, if, that, if that could be done. So I think we will, we will see about that. All right, and um, is this going to be available soon for children? Are they working on the pill form? Those are similar type uh, questions. Uh, don't, don't have a definitive answer for that. Okay, so the next comment, I begin with my first injection in 12 days. Uh, this has been very informative. Thank you. Uh, I've talked to, um, okay, I think that was just a really nice comment. So thanks for that. Um, okay, so somebody else commented, I started in 2018. Um, October responded February 2019, went from bright blonde to dark hair and tans. So similar. Um, next question, is it typical for a slow response several months rather than weeks? Um, and are you finding a correlation between Kuvan responders and Pegvalis? So the first question, um, is it typical for a slow response? It is very typical. That is sort of the norm uh, for people to respond slowly. It's really unusual if someone has an early response and an early response might be 10 weeks into treatment. Um, so for most people, we're, we're seeing it take at least four months, often six months to a year, sometimes more than a year, and with escalating dose. And then the question about a correlation between Kuvan responders and Pegvalis, there is not a correlation um, because Pegvalis does not depend on people having any of their own enzyme activity for the phenylalanine hydroxylase enzyme. So people that respond to Kuvan are not necessarily gonna be the best responders to Pegvalis, they could be. Um, but people um, who have very classical PKU with very low amount of protein they can tolerate, uh, like Lauren can be amazing responders because there's not that correlation. I'll, I'll take a pause in case uh, anything you wanted to share along those lines. Oh, no, keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so this one must be for you, Lauren. Uh, what are your favorite go-to sources of protein? That's hard because I'm trying to stay plant-based since my body doesn't like animal protein very much. So I do a lot of chickpeas. Um, in various forms, we turn it into hummus. Um, I've made a chickpea dressing, which was a little weird, but it was good. Uh, I do a lot of beans, uh, protein shakes, which seems counterintuitive since I've been on formula forever, but 
sometimes I just can't get all of my protein in, so it seems like the easiest option. Uh, I'm not a fan of tofu, and that's probably because I don't know how to cook it right yet. <laughs> um, so I do a lot of vegetables with protein rather than the tofu, like typical vegans or vegetarians. Okay, great. Um, let's see. So we have a comment. I'm on 150 grams of protein in um, per day because I work out and also three 10 milligram shots per week. Uh, 20 milligrams work too well. Five, 10 milligrams uh, worked too well, bad migraines, uh, protein levels uh, were pretty much zero. So um, I think that dose adjustment is really a continuous process because the amount of intact protein that people can tolerate um, will, will change and will improve over time. And then at some point, if someone's on the right dose, it really doesn't even matter how much protein they, they take anymore in terms of what the max is. Uh, I think I had mentioned that I have two patients that take um, also uh, bodybuilders that um, take close to 200 grams of protein a day. Not that, not that, that I mean, I, you know, it may or may not be their actual requirement, but that's what they wish to take and they're able to maintain good levels. So, um, so it's unpredictable what dose is going to work for each person. Uh, so that's why we just have to try going through the schedule and then we stop when we hit the right dose. And then sometimes uh, people's fee levels keep dropping and then we back away on the dose and try to sort of find the sweet spot for somebody at that point in time. But with continued monitoring, uh, sometimes that, that dose will change over time. So that's why it's really helpful uh, to send levels on a regular basis. All right, so next question, Lauren, did you have any, is any issues with anxiety or fears with the injections? I think I shared a little bit that I was really nervous to go into my first injection um, because I had gone through all of the what ifs and I still have that a little bit. I'm worried like, oh, this is going really well. Is it going to stop working? Which I know is probably not a very rational thought, but I worry because I'm so accustomed to it now that I may have to stop it at some point. And I mean, I know I could go back on formula and everything, but I, my diet wasn't controlled. My levels weren't controlled. So that's the fear I have now of what happens if I have to stop this and go back to where I was because I didn't realize how bad I was feeling until I didn't feel that way anymore. But in terms of doing my injections now, it's just another thing that I have to do in, during the day. Um, and eventually I got over the anxiety and fear of doing it. So it, I think the more you do it, the easier it gets. Okay, great. Thank you so much. All right, so, um, so there are some comments um, that I'm, I'm, go I'm hitting on the questions right now. So, um, so do you have to be near a clinic or can you do this from a distance? So I think that this year of COVID has really uh, tested what we thought we could do, um, you know, what we thought we had to do in person. Um, so the first injection, it's mandated that uh, somebody be with their healthcare provider uh, for injection one, that's part of uh, the prescribing information on the label. But, um, but we have been doing subsequent injections virtually um, with my clinic. So I think that, um, I think that it's, it's really good if you are within a range of a clinic that if you're having issues that you could go in and, and be checked out. Um, but if that's not a possibility, I know that there are people that are doing this mostly remotely. I think if you had a local doctor of some sort and your PKU doctor was further away and, and you can go in periodically uh, and definitely for the first injection that it could potentially be done from a distance. Okay, and then um, is tyrosine supplementation still required? That's an excellent question. And that's something that 
I think we've been kind of working through um, during the clinical trials, uh, people were prescribed tyrosine. And once people transitioned into clinic, we had to decide what to do about the tyrosine. So um, if people are on a regular diet, then they're getting plenty of tyrosine from the diet. So, um, so we don't do tyrosine supplementation in my clinic for most of our patients. Um, but if, but we do look at the levels. So if somebody's tyrosine level comes back low, then we're going to recommend supplementation. Or if somebody feels better on tyrosine, then they should stay on tyrosine. Um, but it's not technically required if somebody's responding to um, pigbillies. Okay. Um, for those with well-controlled fee prior to peg pale, um, are cognitive improvements still reported? So peg pale, by the way, was uh, the name of the clinical trial. So peg pale, like the peg is the coating, the pale is the enzyme. For those of you that don't know, um, that sometimes that's used interchangeably with peg bailies. Um, so for people who have well-controlled uh, fee prior to taking it, we don't usually see that aha moment or that clearing of the fog if there wasn't really that to begin with. So yeah, so for the people that were well-controlled, um, I would say that most people are, are feeling the same if, if they're controlled through, through injections or if they're controlled through diet. I think if they're controlled prior, then they're probably not uh, feeling the, the big difference other than the difference uh, in lifestyle. Okay, um, next question. Is there a slower or quicker response in people who had previously controlled levels as opposed to individuals that begin with levels greater than 10 or greater than 20. So in my experience, it, it's sort of independent of the levels. We have some people that start on treatment um, from being on a completely regular diet and uh, a lot of people that are on, on their PKU diet to an extent, um, but not maintaining the levels in the desired range. And then we have had a couple people who were like on a really tight diet with controlled levels. There's not a slower or quicker response. It's just a different way of looking at the response because if somebody is already controlled, then um, the response uh, would, we, we would see less of a decline in fee, but once the fee goes to zero, then we would start liberalizing the diet. So I guess if somebody's starting controlled, then there's less room to go with the feed dropping. So we might be a little quicker to get them started on extra protein um, in their diet. But overall, I think the response is kind of independent of what people are doing before they start, if that makes sense. Sorry if that was a little roundabout of a response. All right, so um, we have somebody commenting about agreeing with Lauren about the fears uh, that you are expressing. Um, somebody is asking about, um, about late diagnosed um, PKU, I believe. So if somebody has classic PKU that was late diagnosed, um, how does Pegvalius function? Uh, we have a couple late diagnosed individuals that we've treated and it works the same way as it would work with somebody who is early treated. And they would have the same benefit that they would have if their fee control became really, uh, really tight from diet. Okay. And so let's see. So I'm gonna go back to the Q and A in a second. I see a couple more here. Um, do you have any patients on a low dose so as to give them more wiggle room in their diet without dropping fee levels so much that their protein requirement significantly change in diet is totally liberalized? Um, I mean, we've, we've had people that want to keep a little bit of formula, like they don't wanna take that last step and completely uh, liberalize the diet. And so, you know, we try to make people comfortable with, um, with what they would want to do in that regards. Um, somebody's asking about pregnancy. So 
I think it's really clinic dependent if they would continue treatment in pregnancy. It's clinic dependent, it's dependent on the individual with PKU. And um, so, yeah, so I, I can't really, I haven't had experience with pregnancy, so I can't answer that. I haven't had experience with our patients um, going off of treatment temporarily during pregnancy and then going back on after the pregnancy uh, has completed. So let's hop over to the Q&A. Okay. Um, what are the other medi medicines that you have taken? So Lauren, I think that is asking you about what other treatments you had tried. I was in the clinical trials for Cuban and my levels dropped, but not enough to make it into the second phase of the trial. Um, and then I started it again after it was approved and it was weird. It didn't work as well as it did in the trials. Um, so I stopped taking it because it wasn't really helping and went back on my regular formula and low pro foods. Okay. The question um, may have also meant uh, they they added along with the Pegvalase. What medicines are you taking? So maybe you're referring to your pre-medications. Okay. Um, so for pre-meds, they have me taking an allergy pill. Um, and I, I take allergy meds anyway, so it's not, not any different than that. Um, but they prescribed it to me so I can take it twice a day if I need to, to help with mostly the injection site stuff that I still get a little bit. And then when I was getting a little bit of joint pain, I was taking a leave as needed. So my joint pain wasn't severe enough to have to go on steroids. Okay, awesome, thanks. All right, I think we have to wrap it up soon, but uh, let me just try to hit these last couple. Um, are there predictors of Pegvalase non-response? No, it's really dependent on someone's immune system and how long their immune system is gonna keep trying to fight off the drug and when it, the immune system will calm down and allow the drug to work. So, um, so it's really unpredictable who's gonna response. Um, someone asked, is Pegvalase the same as Palanzeek? Yes, yes, Palanzeek is the trade name. Uh, we usually use the drug name in the presentations. Um, Okay, are all, are all PKU clinics now offering this therapy? Um, so in the US, um, if a clinic wanted to offer the therapy, then uh, the providers would have to go through a training. It's a very brief training, but it is dependent on the capacity of the clinic and what they feel they're able to handle since there are a lot of other things that go into this treatment. So I think that they're probably not all offering the therapy, but many of them are. And, uh, and you can definitely check locally to see who the, I guess where the closest place would be or try to convince your own clinic to offer it if you, uh, if you really want to. Um, do we recommend a multivitamin? Um, I think a multivitamin is a great idea. And a lot of, a lot of our patients are multivitamins. Um, there's a question, Lauren, if you ever tried feed block before Palancy is the question. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> so okay. no. All right. So that's referring to, um, large neutral amino acids. Oh, okay. no. Great. And, uh, let's see if there's anything else I haven't gotten to. Um, how is the determination that a person is not able to stay? on pig villies. So in my clinic, we don't discontinue people unless they want to be discontinued. Um, even if someone's not responding um, after a year, then we'll go up in the dose and we'll stay on that dose. And we usually will see at least some response. If we, um, in my experience, the longer we wait, the more likely we are to get a response. And sometimes it can even be one or two years into treatment that we could get a response. So, um, the prescribing instructions may be a little bit different, but um, if, you know, I, I have not discontinued people 
um, unless they wanted to be, because I'm still hopeful that they'll get a response. Um, has there been any change in weight? Um, so the pegvalase itself doesn't cause a weight difference, but I think that once people have a liberalized diet, sometimes people want to go and try everything and they eat a lot of restaurant food. And so we have seen um, some weight gain uh, just from the, the change in diet and while people are sort of adjusting and learning how to eat a healthy diet. Um, all right, so I think that is the end of the questions, but I really appreciate these. These are great questions, uh, Lauren. I loved hearing your story. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everybody for attending. Have a great rest of the meeting.